double mic it. Hey, thanks for hanging around. I know we're between you and drinks. That's what they always say at the last fan, all right? Testing. So we've got a, um, an interesting crew here, and they play different roles in the uh, on-demand or other parts of the uh, hyper-local ecosystem. And I think what's most interesting, I don't think anybody's a complete direct competitor here, but there's probably some differences of view, points of view about their philosophies about what they're doing here. So the concepts that we'd like to talk about uh, this afternoon are what can some of these new technologies that are related to on-demand, what can they do to uh, make a brick and mortar store, whether it's a small business or a franchise or whatever, a branch office, um, competitive with e-commerce. So one of the things I think you, you'd sort of say, what, do you, what is e-commerce as epitomized by Amazon and frequently and increasingly by Walmart, I suppose, these days too? What is it bringing to the table that, uh, that, a, that a brick and mortar store has to compete with? There's, you know, there's, there's uh, aggressive pricing, there's, uh, uh, there's all sorts of um, not quite personalization, but recommendations and things like that. There's uh, there's wide variety of, of products in general, at least if it's if it's Amazon or something like that. So there's you know there's a handful of core things that you know most brick and mortar companies probably can't compete head to head with, and with Amazon and others getting increasingly into the um, uh, the delivery business themselves or their fast delivery, one of the kind of the things that used to be a unifying competitive advantage for the local guy with the instance gratification has kind of been uh, you know, reduced in its, its value. So we'll, we'll, we'll discuss what kind of things these guys bring to the table. So the first thing, and I'll stop talking, I promise. First thing I wanted to do is have everybody uh, um, introduce themselves and you know, 140 characters or less kind of thing, say what part of the ecosystem, what your company does and what part of the ecosystem you're in. And, and just for, uh, why don't we end with, with you, Daphne. So let's start with you, Mike. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so Mike Dudas, co-founder, chief revenue officer, of Button. Uh, Button's whole premise is that you know mobile advertising is broken. So uh, our product uh, works with mobile publishers who have content, typically information um, relevant to this discussion. It's often information, you know, TripAdvisor, local reviews about a local hotel, uh, a local restaurant. It could be Yelp. Um, so what we try to do is historically, Foursquare is another you know, company in the space, sorry, more than 140 characters already. <laughs> uh, but bottom line is, historically people have gone to these apps, to these mobile websites of these properties, and they've looked at them as information sources. What Button aims to do is turn them into actionable content and allow a user to go to those places and find utility in terms of information, but also find the ability to, for example, if it's Foursquare, Book, in a, book a table with Open Table. You know, get a ride to the restaurant with Uber. Uh, purchase a ticket. You know, at this particular venue to see a movie with Fandango, etc. So we're making content actionable and making it easy to move from one service to another on mobile. And I'll explain how that helps yeah, yeah. SMBs later. Exactly. That's and that we'll have the, we'll have each of them do their pitch to a local merchant or something. So Andy, tell me what uh, what you guys are doing. Sure. My my, my name is Andy Elwood. I'm president of a company called Basket. And it's fun to be back on stage. I was here three years ago when I was with Waze. And it was actually three years ago when I was with Waze that the idea for Basket was being formed through an e-commerce experience by my co-founder, Neil Kataria. As a serial entrepreneur and father of three, uh, he just had his third kid. And a, a box from Amazon.com and a box from Diapers.com were sitting on his front porch. And being a big data guy and you know, he's a successful entrepreneur, but he just was curious, if I went and bought these exact same things in a local store, how much would it cost me? And how much am I paying for the convenience of having it just show up on my front porch? So like any good big data nerd, grabbed a, a notebook and went into stores and wrote down the prices for all of the things that he, he had received via delivery the day before. And what he, he went to five different stores, and what surprised him was not that he had overpaid for the delivery by about 10%, uh, give or take, but that there was, an off, there was a difference in price from one offline store to another of over 30%. And so he was curious if it was just his neighborhood, uh, just maybe gentrification, whatever it might have been, uh, in the part of uh, Washington, D.C. he was in. But then he expanded that to 30, and then 50, and then 100 stores, and found not, without coupons, without discounts, just in the changing of offline prices at uh, retailers, he was able to, by turning right or turning left at one intersection, 
save upwards of 20 and 30 and sometimes 40% on his groceries. That launched the idea that is now Basket, and we've crowdsourced over 960,000 uh, SKUs um, at 165,000 grocery stores around the country, and currently in the app right now, we have over a billion prices live to create what we believe is the first ever smart shopping list. So if you give me this week's groceries and uh, on your shopping list, I will tell you which stores carry all of those products and at what price so that you can make the most informed decision, whether it be to go to the, uh, the store that's closest by because you, you're in a rush and you need those five ingredients before soccer practice, or you've got some time and you're willing to drive a little bit further to save, uh, save 20 or 30% on your groceries. All righty. And uh, Daphne, what role does Deliv play in yeah, the so uh, ecosystem? Daphne. Is this on? You're on. So uh, I'm Daphne Carmelli, and I'm the founder and CEO of Deliv. Um, we're a same-day, uh, last-mile delivery and return service. Um, what makes us fundamentally different from anything else you might use um, is that we're not ourselves an app. We're not a destination that any one of you would go to. Um, you'll find us on the checkout page of uh, large omnichannel retailers uh, like a Macy's, a Bloomingdale's, uh, most recently a, a Walmart or a Walgreens or a Best Buy and all of those. In addition, we power the deliveries for folks like Google Shopping Express, Bloom That, a lot of e-commerce players, um, about 4,000 or so uh, small businesses, B2B or B2C businesses across the country, um, and also uh, most recently with a partnership and investor, uh, UPS, do delivery last miles uh, for UPS. Um, and uh, fundamentally what we do kind of in this local world is that um, we're able to help all, all retailers uh, really out Amazon, Amazon. Um, there are very few Achilles heels that Amazon has. Um, one of them is that their inventory still by and large is far from the population uh, of people who buy it. Um, and when you're a physical brick and mortar store, um, you don't have that problem. You don't have to find warehouses to store your inventory. You have them, they're in your stores. So the idea is leveraging your stores to be customer facing, forward facing distribution centers. Um, we do the pickup and delivery. I'm gonna do a worst practice here on panel management and ask everybody the same question, but I promise I won't ever do it again. Uh, but it's particularly, it's protect, yeah, right, because I, I don't, I don't think you will. <laughs> you're great, no, you're That's great. That's the yeah, trick. Great. And I'm gonna start with Delive. So pitch, I'm a local, I, you just actually started your pitch. So I'm a local, or I'm a merchant that has uh, brick and mortar stores. Pitch me, tell me how I, how I use you to compete against Amazon. Um, I, I think fundamentally with any merchant, it's uh, that Amazon in the last 18 to 24 months um, has put at the core of the customer experience the speed and flexibility of when and how you can get your merchandise. So you, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, merchant, if you're selling physical goods, you absolutely have to now compete because Amazon has set the standard. Right. Uh, that same day is now the new standard shipping and you need an answer. So can I save any money that, or can, or at least, it, it's it, it does it's, it's not free. It's, it's what a, do it's I? It's about winning the winning the buy button. If I'm not if there, if, if I don't do it, I'm just going to be out of the consideration. It, it, exactly. So, yeah. um, a few years ago, Amazon Prime came out, and Amazon set two day shipping to be the standard. Uh -huh. And there's not anyone out there selling any physical goods that doesn't have a two day option. And now Amazon has set, increased the bar and, and set the standard now to be same day. So if you don't have the capability to deliver that, um, you're just going to fundamentally lose the buy button. Okay. And now, Andy, you're very different. Now, you're not actually doing a delivery. You're, you're trying to get me to go someplace. So tell me, so pitch me. I'm a, I'm a brick and mortar store. How, do, how, do your, how does your service help me compete? Sure. C a couple things. Um, when, when you know, we set out as the consumer champion, I don't care where you make your purchase. I'm not incentivized to drive traffic one place or the other. I want to be the place that you begin your path to purchase uh, as the kayak of offline commerce, as the Google for local product search. So by engaging with our platform, local businesses are able to make sure that they're represented within any search terms. So um, we have, uh, we've crowdsourced all of the information that we had because retailers didn't want to play ball with us three years ago. And so we went the forgiveness, not permission route mm -hmm. to get all the information that we have. Um, we have a very active community of shoppers that are in stores. Uh, for local businesses, in a lot of cases, we're able to help them actually identify which products they win against other local businesses on. Um, so 
small, medium-sized businesses that have a Walmart move into the neighborhood, we worked with the city of Washington, D.C. and their, their economic development group to actually audit their stores compared to the big box retailers that were coming inside and saying, these are products that you carry that they don't carry, and these are products that you beat them on price, and those are where you may want to focus your business to make sure that you don't lose market share, specifically on those products. The second thing is, because we have people's shopping lists, in the same way that we allow consumers to peek into local stores, we're allowing local stores to peek into consumer demand nearby. And so, for example, this morning there's 620 uh, shopping lists in Washington, D.C. that have paper towels on them. But what else is on the list? And what else might be a winning point? And that's what we're, that's what we're providing back to our B2B businesses. So there's a bit of shared data across. Actually, that's another theme, I think, about these kind of network effects and people that we'll maybe address in a second. Now, Mike, give me your pitch. So uh, yes. how, do, how do you help me compete? So we look at it as there's really two categories of brick and mortar merchants that we help. There's sort of the large retailers mm -hmm. and then there's SMBs. On the large retailer front, we don't actually help them at all with their in-store sales. But what we try to do is help them with their e-commerce and mobile commerce sales, which severely, severely lag Amazon. So in every way, shape, and form, traditional retailers lag Amazon. Their APIs are five years behind. Their payment terms are far behind. The technology is not well distributed. And no publisher thinks, hey, I'm going to make money um, by implementing Walmart's affiliate program. Everybody, 90% you know, of folks implement Amazon's. What we're trying to do is democratize that and bring that level of affiliation, um, push other retailers' APIs out to more publishers to drum up their sales in new places. Um, so that's the way that we help large retailers, but we help them with e-commerce and e-commerce. Uh, on the SMB front, we do it by proxy of marketplaces. So I used the Foursquare example. If I'm in Foursquare, if I'm in Yelp and I want to book an open table, um, that restaurant is an SMB. Uh, but we can't, you know, scalably go out to every restaurant and connect them to these large publishers. So we do that by virtue of marketplaces like Open Table for restaurants, Groupon for local deals, and you know, go down up and down the categories. Um, but that's how we help SMBs. And then Andy, you had a thing about uh, um, an extra benefit of getting people into the stores versus delivery. So maybe tell yeah. me tell me that story because so that's so a, it's, that's it's, probably a big part of your pitch. It's 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 been a been a really interesting. Um, Building the platform that we've built with Basket has been really interesting because there's been so many different interpretations of it um, and so many different different ways that uh, we've just kind of had to keep our eye on the ball and, and be very, very focused. But one of, one of the, the ways that we're, you know, we want to do whatever we can to help people save time and save money. Um, you know, most of the innovation that's happened in commerce, specifically um, in, over the past two or three years, has been for people who have more money than they have time. Right, so it's like, I have all this money, will somebody please just get me a kale salad faster? Right? And, and that, that has worked, and that's been, you know, what's been driving a lot of this, but what, for a lot of people, they, they don't have time or money, and they're looking for ways to save both. And so we launched a pilot program with Uber a month ago in Richmond, Virginia, and, in, and if you built your shopping list in Basket, you could then decide which store you wanted to shop at, and then Uber would come and take you to the store and home for free. And so what our, what our hypothesis or our, our theory was, was that somebody going into a store was going to spend more money than somebody who was pushing the button for delivery. So if you have seven things on your delivery shopping list, okay. you're going to get seven things delivered to your house. If I take you to the store and you have seven things on your list, you're going to p probably purchase more. So it finished yesterday. And you know, this, this is the first time we're sharing these numbers publicly, but there was a 42% lift on every single grocery that was the average across all of the Uber riders who chose to go into stores versus get delivery. Um, and that was a, a really interesting stat for us and something that, that we're really excited to be, be moving forward with, with Uber on was that getting somebody into a store, if they went in with seven, they were coming out with 12. That's, yeah, so that, that's really yeah, interesting, and we've got some when we've worked, particularly when we started with the large national retailers, they call that sort of in, the, in their world the attachment rate. Um, you're going to come in for a dollar, you're going to leave with a dollar forty. And one of the things that, that we found, particularly in retail, um, we, we don't work with kind of perishables and do kind of, uh, kind of 
your, your tacos or whatever that might be. But what we find is that on the other side of it, the return rates are drastically reduced when you're getting something and you're getting it fast. Um, so what we found is in the apparel business, maybe 50% of everything that's bought on, on e-commerce is actually returned. Um, across the board against other SKUs, it could be maybe 9%. So apparel really does skew it. Electronics is pretty high. And we're able to see that down to very, very low single digits. Um, so on the flip side of the attachment rate is the less time you have to change your mind, get it elsewhere, um, you open it, that, that, that kind of instant gratification, you get it. So it's a very, very interesting uh, thing that we do, and a lot of retailers also use it for returns that if you do need to bring it and you're not sure what you want and you buy the pants that's the size you are, the pants the size you wish you were, and then you, you have them delivered, you bring back the one. So there's a lot of different use cases that yeah. uh, retailers are experimenting with. Yeah, and, and, we, and we were really excited. You know, Richmond was a, a unique place for us to, to launch this because it's a seat of government, there's college town, yep. and there's a really interesting blend of downtown and suburbs, but then there's also parts of town that are uh, food deserts um, where there's one grocery store for a low-income community, and we saw people actually going to places that had better savings, that potentially had better products. Um, and so there's a, a really interesting opportunity there. Yeah. Um, and, and we've actually commissioned a study with Texas A&M University around that idea to study low-income families who all of a sudden didn't realize they had choice and they can actually know before they go. Um, and right now, uh, people are averaging about $80, $85 a month in savings, which is about $1,000 a year of after-tax dollars that families are keeping and spending on things that they actually want to, as opposed to nice. overpaying for nice. groceries just because they didn't know that they were overpaying. So the ones of you, the people on the panel that are equal opportunity arms merchants um, and have you know competitors using your service, is there a way that I can stand out? If I'm a, if I'm a Mike, is there anything I can do as a merchant to say, uh, if, if you've got two people using buttons and integrated into your network and playing in the marketplace, yeah, where I, I can I can come out ahead or, or get make sure I'm in front of somebody. Absolutely, you know, we already start to see data, <clears throat> you know, in areas like food delivery, and I won't name specific services where, you know, the tap through rates are much higher, the install rates, the conversion rates, um, and then the repeat visits. So, you know, I, I liken it to, I worked at Google for a number of years, sort of the quality score. We match that against willingness to pay, right? So each one of the sort of buttons that, that shows says, hey, we'll pay X cost per install and we'll pay Y percent commission on each transaction. Um, and so we match that, you know, sort of the amount they'll pay as well as sort of the customer satisfaction and performance weight that together uh, and then show the best button for the consumer, for the publisher, and, and for button. So if, if so, that, if I'm that's in an ideal yeah, world, yeah, right? So we're, yeah. we're, we're still building up that model, yeah. but that's the ultimate model. So the, the idea would be if I'm a merchant, I can sort of choose amongst the publishers I'd want to do right business now, with yeah, or, we've or made favor it very them. Because you know, we're, we're early, it's a new yeah, sure. model, and to get really big folks that we work with comfortable, it's a double opt-in network. Sometimes there's express preference uh -huh. about which partners folks want to work with, but when there's not express preference, we'll give multiple options and show them and see what consumers choose. And you guys are all about price transparency. Is there any way I can stand out or I just have to do a good, good job at it? Yeah, so with, you know, with price and transparency, we've built the um, we've built your inventory through crowdsourcing because a lot of retailers weren't necessarily ready to play uh, ball right. when we got started. Um, so Kroger carries uh, forty to 50,000 items at any given time. They've got about 120,000 in their catalog. We have 960,000 in our catalog, and we're, and we're matching them across stores. And so we're actually starting to see retailers who've understood, okay, you guys pulled an end around on us. Um, it probably makes sense for us to actually give you our prices now to make sure that, because if we're doing promotions or we want people to know about a better price, you guys are now controlling the path to purchase to, and it makes us look more favorable. And so that's what we're seeing is a lot of folks wanting to actually make sure that their prices are up to date faster than our crowdsourced mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. team is able to do it, um, which is, you know, week over week, we're, you know, we're, okay. we're cranking out a couple hundred thousand. So they work closer processes. with you, they're more likely to get better results and things. Now, Deliv, you're, you're white labeled purely, yeah, so it's, so it's kind of up what, to them. But what, it's, it's up to them, but what retailers, you know, it's an evolution and it's yeah. still early. What retailers are learning and doing um, is, it, it's really important for the customer experience that when you're, when you, when you are shopping, 
that things come up. So inventory visibility and, and making it easy to find the products. So a lot of the uh, retailers are starting to put search for same day. People are familiar with the search for buy online, pick up in store, search for pick up. Now it's search for same day, um, offering a, a return service uh, and just making it visible on the website. Um, and then adding it and extending it beyond the different channels. So whether you're buying online um, at a Macy's or you're actually in a Macy's uh, or you're in a store and you don't want to carry those big bedding or that big microwave or whatever it is you bought and you mm -hmm. want to ship it home or you're calling into a call center. So having it available at all the channels, whether it be your app, your mobile app, your, your website, your call center or in your brick and mortar store. Sounds good. I'm painfully conscious of the fact that we're uh, we you know ran over a little bit on the um, uh, the big showcase p uh, performance so I don't think I should take any questions so we just close it off here and uh, or is there, we're okay for a couple of questions so let's pass the mic um, if there's anybody that has anything they want to ask any of our uh, panelists about where they're what they're uh, bringing to the table looks like a question up front hi uh, I was curious for basket what's your business model? Sure. So uh, a couple of things. You know, we, we've been really fortunate to see that once somebody downloads and builds their first shopping list with us, um, about 83% of the things that they put on that first shopping list stay on the shopping list week over week. Um, but we also are, are able to learn a lot about uh, our users in that process. So if you have diapers on your shopping list, we can start to build a cohort around that. If you have dog food, if you have, um, there's a variety of things that we learn about somebody through that, uh, that process. Also, we know that um, with a very strong likelihood from the moment that you start to edit your shopping list or build the shopping list, you're going to be opening it again in a store 72 hours later or within the next 72 hours. And so there's a consideration set where perhaps you put Pepsi, but maybe you meant to put Coke. Um, th so that's a pretty interesting piece there. Additionally, uh, Nielsen and IRI have a duopoly on all of the, the data inside of retailers that they sell to uh, brands and to manufacturers. Um, but all of that data is scrubbed and is used by permission only. Um, and so all of our data um, is happening in real time. That data is showing up 30 to 45 days later. Um, and so people are making decisions in hindsight as opposed to in real time. Um, so we're able to, tr to both uh, understand consumer intent, understand how a product got onto your shopping list, where was it uh, previously, and then on the, the business side, provide uh, real-time data around pricing uh, com and competitive analysis and locally. Do you send the user out then, like sort of the affiliate model on, you know, hey, these are the things in your cart? Yes, well, so, so we're showing folks, this is how much it would cost if you got it delivered. Yep. This is how much it would cost if you go to the store. And it's up to you to make the decision from there. Kind of. Mm. But this not facilitating business model to come. I'm always interested, but <laughs> yes. not facilitating the transaction. That's Let's correct. Let's do a BD deal right now. I'd love to. Okay, maybe one more question from the floor or ready to go start drinking? <laughs> I think I can hear the we, answer. We, we, to don't, that. we don't blame you. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go do a deal yeah, over yeah, It's true. It's true. There you go. All right. Watch it happen on Twitter well, live. Hey, we'll, uh, we'll give it up it. for the panelists. Thanks, everybody, for hanging around today. Let's go have a drink. <laughs>